Yesterday. Oh, my trouble seems so far away. I, I like people. I like being around them. He's always, I think, what one might call good value, Trevino. Mr. Small Ball, bigger hole. Yeah. <laughs> that might use me a tennis yeah. ball tomorrow. Come on, Hubie, show him that hat you have on. If it rains, your head will weigh about 400 pounds. Lee Trevino. Would There's you name him when shot. mentioning the all-time greats of the game? His relatively short 16-year career produced six major championships and 29 PGA Tour victories. The Merry Mex, as he would become known, would spend his life defying the odds, taking the journey from a local caddy to become a Hall of Famer. Trevino was one of the great ball strikers. But rather than his illustrious career, perhaps it was his personality, his love of the game and the smiles he brought to the world of golf, which stood him apart from the crowd. This is Tales of the Open. This is the story of Lee Trevino. Gathered in Southport on the Irish Sea in Lancashire, England, for the 100th Open Championship. Huge crowds came with them to smash all existing attendance records, and ironically it was Royal Birkdale, the latest links to be placed on the championship rota, that played host to this historic event. Having collected his second US Open just a month earlier at Merion, before following that up with a win at the Canadian Open, Trevino returned to the Lancashire coast in 1971 as one of the favourites to lift the claret jug. The year previously, the Merry Mex had finished in a tie for third at St Andrews, having led the championship for the first three rounds, but had faltered to a final round 77, with the great Jack Nicholas eventually going on to claim the victory. Royal Birkdale was to provide another stern test, with even his accommodation for the week providing an early challenge. Well, the Open in 1971 was at Birkdale, and I stayed at the Prince of Wales. And they gave me a room above the kitchen. <laughs> and I was going to tell you, they're lucky that they gave a Mexican that room because no, no one else could have stayed there, I'm telling you, because I'm used to the heat. And it was bloody hot that week. That week. And so uh, we, we, were, we, we, were, we were steaming up there. And here's the man they're all going to watch, Lee Trevino. And they're watching him because in the last three weeks, he's won the US Open and the Canadian Open. And here he is on the first green, the first round, this to start with a birdie. And in it goes. And right ahead of him in the procession, playing the 18th, his fourth shot, is the Formosan golfer, Lu Liang Huan. Got about a four or five footer now to save his power to finish in 70, and the power is 73. This amiable player raises his hat in a gesture that's been copied all over the world, and so for that matter is the hat. Lu Liang Huan, or Mr. Lu as he became better known, was to play a starring role in the centennial playing of the Open. A gloriously sunny first round was played that Wednesday, the then traditional starting day for the Open Championship. And by the end of proceedings, Lou sat at three under par, one stroke behind the informed Trevino, with a host of others, including Tony Jacklin, also firmly in contention. Day two would continue in similar fashion. Back to Trevino, this time at the 18th. He's five under. Jacklin seven under, Lou six. Trevino here has a putt for three, which would be an eagle. A 50-footer on 18 for eagle meant that Trevino would have a tie for the lead for a second consecutive day. <laughs> Wonderful finish for Trevino, and he joins Jacklin at seven under after two rounds. In round three, Trevino would be paired with Jacklin, a pairing that would foreshadow what was to come a year later at Muirfield. 
The two of them jostled for position alongside Mr. Lou, but birdies at 17 and 18 for Trevino would see him finish the day one stroke clear of his two rivals, setting up a final round pairing with Mr. Lou on Championship Saturday. He and I go way back. We go way back. In 1959, uh, Mr. Lou and I played a match in Tam Sui in Taiwan. And believe it or not, he beat me. He beat me 10 and 8. He won every hole. Ten straight holes. And then a month later, he came to Okinawa, and I played him, and I beat him four and three. But we had been friends forever and ever and ever. And now for the fourth and final round of this tremendous Open Championship. Mr. Lou playing in the last pair this time, 10 under with Trevino 11 under. Lee Trevino. Uh, Willie. Let me try the three wood. I don't want to hit the one iron today. I think there's just not enough wind there. I really don't want to hit the three wood, but I can't. I got to play this round. Can't pass, Pazzi. They're way over there. A birdie at the first hole for Trevino was the start of one of the most incredible front nines in Open Championship history. His ball striking was good, but with the putter. Supermix simply could not miss. I came out firing. I birdied, I believe I birdied four of the first five. And I remember birdieing one, birdieing two. And I remember there was a, a the dog leg right, the fifth or sixth hole. Trevino, having birdied the fourth, has another putt for a birdie to go 14 under. Never saw this putting as Trevino has exhibited so far. He's 14 under, Lou still 11 under. I remember hitting five wood about four inches. And Mr. Lou called me Bird. And he said, Bird, he said, do you want to go through? He wanted to know if I wanted to play by myself because I kept birding this hole. Quite extraordinary. And he's four under par for the first six holes at this supreme moment. Out the eighth, Lou is Still 11 under, Trevino 15. But he's only got this one to stay 15 under. And you hardly believe the evidence of their eyes as it goes in. That tournament shouldn't even have been close until when I stand on the 17th tee, I had lost two shots. And um, shouldn't have done that. Uh, and yeah, you lose your concentration. You, you forget why you're there in the first place. In other words, you, you, it's okay to interact with people, but not every second. You understand what I'm saying? And so, yeah, I lost my concentration for a little bit. Now, my fault. It was my fault. Willie was trying to kick me in the rear, but uh, you know me. I, I'm kind of a self-made guy, and uh, I, I, I've never been one for authority, and I don't take... Uh, you know, I don't, I don't take criticism lightly, you know. I, I, uh, uh, I, go, I kind of my own guy, you know, always been that way. And what happened is I got in trouble on the 17th hole. Uh, I was using the small ball, uh, which everyone was, and I aimed it left side up on the hill and I was gonna cut it in the fairway, and I did. In other words, I hit it straight. And it got up there to almost an unplayable line. It took me two shots to get out. Right here. Trevino's ball had barely moved out of the sandy wasteland of the dune where it had come to rest, and he was faced with the same problem again. Oh my God. Hello. Now, there was a dramatic tragedy for Trevino. Three ahead. And now, only one ahead. He's played three, lose one. Now, this is a great moment for Lou. He could just about reach the green. Oh, no, he fell right away from that one. Actions speak louder than words. And he's short of the green on the right. 
And Mr. Lou was just right in front of the green, right side. I can remember it right now. And he was close to that bunker. There's a little pop bunker on the right side there. And he had a very simple little chip down. And he chipped with too much of a lofted club. And the ball checked on him. And he left it about 10 feet short. And he missed it. See the difference between them? When they started this hole, here's Trevino coming up with not a very good pitch. That's his fifth. Trevino would miss the putt and card a double bogey seven. It meant that he would go to 18 with a one-stroke lead, but perhaps surprisingly, feeling somewhat relieved. I, I was upset of what I did, but also I, I've been in this position before, and, uh, and Willie, uh, uh, Willie Aitchison says to me, he says, listen, don't get upset. He said, you're still leading. He said, now, if you'd have lost your lead, he said, I can see where you could get upset. He said, but you, you didn't lose your lead. You only lost two shots. So there's everything to play for between these two. Lou first. Still swinging nice and quietly, but that's over to the left somewhere. So we know nothing deterred. Gives it a good bang there, and in fact, it goes right down the middle. Still a great spirit between these two as they come up to this crucial hole. Trevino, one ahead at the 72nd hole. As they walked off the 18th tee, the two men hugged, laughed and joked their way up the fairway as the crowd wrapped around them in traditional open fashion. If they were feeling nerves, then neither showed it. But Mr Lou's ball had finished in a very awkward lie. It was a good two feet above his stance on the edge of a bunker on the left-hand side of the fairway. A bad break for the man from Taiwan. I knew that the golf gods were watching over him because he hit a drive almost in the left bunker and I was to the right of the bunker. I hit six iron to the back of the green. I remember the club I hit. I hit it to the back of the green. That's what I was trying to do. And the pin was kind of middle left or back left a little bit, close to that bunker on the left and Mr. Lou had to stand in the bunker with the club you know just almost belt level belt buckle level and he swung at this wood trying to roll it and he swung over the top of the ball hit it in the heel and the ball came right back over his shoulder and hit a lady god bless her soul right between the eyes and that must be a tremendous hook into or over the crowd somewhere and, I mean, she was bleeding pretty bad. And her cries of, is there a doctor in the house? And Mr. Lou was very upset. The man who was actually standing beside her when this happened told me that if it hadn't hit the spectator, Lou's ball would have vanished into some of the thickest rough in Berkeley. But the thing about it is the ball came back out in the fairway. His ball was going to go in the, in, the, in the gorse or the heather over there. And it came back out in the fairway. And Mr. Lou, I think, hit eight iron or seven iron uh, on the green. He hit it about eight feet. I putted my ball down three feet from the hole. Well, that's a pretty good one, about three feet, but not dead at such a moment. Now, this is the vital one, six or seven feet. This to make Trevino putt his to win. What a wonderful putt by Mr. Lou. After all that, he gets his birdie four. And Trevino has got to hold this one. A little less than Sanders missed last year. Exactly the same way, and before anybody could really see him do it, he knocked it in. Thrown his hat to the crowd. Trevino is the champion. He holds his. At the time, my confidence was so up with the putter that I wasn't taking any time whatsoever. I just won the U.S. Open and the Canadian Open. This is my third tournament in a row. And I was putting extremely well. And actually, the television missed the putt. If you look at that film, Mr. Lou was parading around with his little hat up off his head, and everybody was giving him a high, you know, giving him a standing ovation, and the camera was following Mr. Lou. And I put my ball down and didn't even line it up. I just pulled my ball down, picked up the coin, went around, knocked a three-footer in the middle of the hole to win my third tournament in a row. And uh, TV missed it. They missed it. Wouldn't have missed it today because a lot of cameras today, a lot of cameras. 
As winners go, the Birkdale crowd could not have been happier. They took Mr. Liu to their hearts and would have cheered him home had he gone on to be victorious. But Trevino had endeared himself to the British public. They hadn't seen a golfer with such a talent for entertainment before, and certainly not one capable of dominating the sport. In typical fashion, his speech at the prize-giving ceremony struck the perfect balance of humour and gratitude. The champion golfer of the year, with a score of 278 and prize money of £5,500, Lee Trevino. Gosh, there's not too much I can say that hasn't already been said, but... Uh, we had a tremendous day out today. I was playing with Lou. We were having a lot of fun. He, was, he made the statement that he wanted to apologize to the lady that he hit on the 18th. I said, you don't need to apologize to her. Her lawyer will be contacting you in the next two days. But I would like to say one thing, get a little serious here, which I don't get very often. But uh, I would like to thank everybody here at Royal Burkdale. I enjoy playing here very, very much. Uh, and I was really looking forward to coming back and playing your great golf course. But I do want to say that without you people supporting us, we wouldn't be able to have these golf tournaments. So for me to you, thank you very much for letting, or just being able to win your great, great trophy. Thank you very much. So it's Lee to be champion of the United States. Well, the championship in 1972 was Muirfield, and we decided to leave El Paso and go to the championship. I was defending champion. And we rented the Yester House, which is the castle there in Gifford. And we landed at the wrong airport. God's truth, landed at the wrong airport. We are supposed to have gone into Glasgow, Edinburgh, and we got off at Presswick, okay? So here we are, I'm defending champion, had the claret jug, everything. I'm walking off the airplane. I'm waiting for the media and all my fans and everybody to say, man, the man is back. The man is back. Not a soul. Not a person. Nowhere in the airport. Every year, the Open seems to attract more and more people. And this year was no exception. Once again, the records were broken and 84,000 people came to watch in the four days. Lee Trevino, the gay extrovert, and also, incidentally, the holder. All eyes, though, are really on Jack Nicholas and the prospect of his grand slam. He's got two legs in hand already. Now he wants this one and the USPGA Championship. The links of Muirfield were set to provide a stern test. The examination would be golf in its purest form. The way we found that is that it had a drought. And the course was extremely fast, extremely fast. And actually the greens were burned out. In other words, they were putting the flags only in the low spots because that's where the only green grass was. When we finished there, that tournament, there was not a blade of green grass anywhere on it. It was just all brown. I was hitting one irons 300 yards and, 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 and what have you off the tee. Lee Trevino prepares to defend his title. He seemed happy with that. And now Trevino on the 18th, he has to get down in two from here for a par 71. And does it right in the middle of the hole. A good par start for Trevino. The afternoon saw a lovely day turn wet as the rain swept across the Firth of Forth. Jack Nicholas was out in the worst of it but perhaps the extra moisture in the turf helped him to a one under par round of 70. So at the end of the first day, it's Tupling three under, Jacklin two under, Nicholas one under, and Trevino even. The second round continued in the same vein. A stiff breeze alongside the fast and firm conditions meant scoring remained tough. Jacklin has a long one for a try for a birdie. And in it goes to the general delight. Jacqueline and Trevino were in at minus one, with Nicholas just a stroke back at even par. And for the third round, some more wonderful weather, huge crowds pouring in again, and all the players they've come to see grouped together at the top of the tree. 
Isn't this a beautiful day? This would even be a nice day in Houston. The third round, Championship Friday, moving day, and Jacqueline was fastest out of the blocks. Tony was gone. He had a big lead uh, with about five holes to go. Jacqueline putting for a three. And there's an eagle three for Jacqueline. He goes. Tony was as fine a player as I've ever seen. I mean, he could do it all. He, he was a good looking guy. I mean, uh, very marketable. Uh, besides, he could really play. He could really play. Jacqueline had moved himself clear of the pack with some excellent golf. But Trevino, never to be outdone, was about to go on a very special run. Trevino in a hot streak here. He's had birdies at the 14th and 15th to go three under. That, lo that looks to be hooked to me, the short 16th. And in fact it is. And he's very awkwardly placed in the bunker there. What happened next would set the tone for the remainder of the championship. See how awkwardly that lies in the back of the bunker and he's got to get it up over the face and stop it fairly quickly. Very difficult one. Looks like going over the back. And instead of that, it goes straight into the middle of the hole and disappears like a rabbit on the second bounce. And I verily think it would have gone over the back of the green. So there's a two for Trevino. He goes four under. A birdie four at 17 was matched by Jacqueline. And the two men stepped onto the 18th tee, both at five under par. Trevino first. Yes, beauty. Jacqueline. <laughs> I can make a birdie here. I never made five birdies in a row in Great Britain. I mean in yeah. Scotland, excuse me. <laughs> no hesitation. Pitches it up. Six iron. And too far. And over the back. About a yard. And here's Trevino from the back trying to get down in two more for his par. And then I chipped in on 18 from the left side. Well, that really was a diabolical one. Five in a row. What an achievement. Friday felt like a final round. It had drama to the finish and set up another epic battle between Trevino and Jacqueline. The two competitors shared a moment, laughing together as they left the 18th, preparing for what they thought would be a two-horse race heading into Saturday's final round. Nicholas starting six behind now and surely out of it. Six strokes was a large deficit to overcome, but if one thing had been learned over the previous decade, you can never count out Jack Nicholas. And that's a birdie for Nicholas. 32, starting even, now four and. Meanwhile, Trevino faltered, dropping two strokes, whilst Jacqueline had lost just the one. Yet another birdie, and here is a charge, if ever there was one in golf, by Nicholas. Birdies at 10 and 11 put Nicholas clear of the final pairing. But when they got to the ninth hole, and the roars of the crowds following Jack clearly sparked them into life. Jacqueline? His second shot to the long ninth. There's a magnificent one, probably the best scene in the whole championship. Along comes Trevino. And that one's very nearly as good. And he's made it. Eagle three for Trevino at the ninth. So that's six under and back in the lead. There's Jacqueline on the ninth, putting for his eagle. And that's two of them on his par five ninth hole. The names competing atop the leaderboard could hardly have elicited more excitement from the Muirfield galleries. The three previous Open champions, all with their eyes on the prize. Nicholas and Trevino at six under, Jacqueline at five. Jacqueline on the twelfth, about five yards is for a birdie. To go six under. The three were all tied. Nicholas, a few holes ahead, lipped out on the 16th, making bogey. 
A par par finish meant he would set the mark in the clubhouse with a score of 279, five under par. When we came to that last round on the 17th hole, I got ready to hit my tee ball and the cameraman ran in front of the tee and I backed off and I went up to hit it again and then the guy with the tripod for the camera ran in front of me again. So I had to back off twice from hitting my tee ball and I hit a bad tee ball. I hit it in the bunker on the left. I had to come out sideways. And that's a bad one by Trevino. It's hooked into a bunker under a steep face. He has bunkered it. He's put it in the first bunker, which is gonna be very, uh, very bad because I don't think he can get do much out of there except hit it maybe 40 or 50 yards forward. And I'm not sure he can get on in his third shot from there. He'll have great difficulty getting near the green and three. And there you saw the lie he had. He fell down after he hit it. I had put my ball pin high to the left on 17, the par five. And Tony was right next to me in two, but I was in three. And I chipped first, I was out. And I kind of caught it a little clean and the ball went <laughs> past the flag up on the hill. In other words, in the rough. That's another disappointment. It runs about 12 feet over the back of the green. Simple little shot for Jackie. He knows so well in these seaside crosses. Tony chipped it and he didn't hit it very well. He hit it 20 feet short. He was actually away with his 20 footer. I was closer. But he knew that I was a little upset. And he says, oh, he says, come on up if you want to. And that's usually protocol. In other words, when you're off the green and the guy's on the green, generally let them chip up, you see. Torino chips it nonchalantly down there. And nobody believes our eyes but confound it, that's the fourth time in this championship and Torino tips it in from off the green. Really, garbage. Three times in two days, Tony Jacklin had to watch as Trevino hold out from off the green at the most crucial of moments. And finally, it got to him. Well, it shook him up so bad that he hit a terrible putt and he hit it three feet left of the hole. I mean, he wasn't even close. And then he missed that. Jacqueline would later go on to admit that that very moment, although he didn't know it at the time, was the beginning of the end of his career. In this game, when every time you hit a ball on a golf course, you're going to be some bad bouncers, there are going to be some good bouncers. And that's, that's how you have to look at it. And Tony didn't look at it that way, evidently. I never talked to him about it. You know, that's his business, and it had to be hard to do because... He was a force to be reckoned with. I'm telling you, he could play. He could play. When he when he won the U.S. Open at Hazeltine in 1970, that's about as hard a golf course as we had ever played in the U.S. Open. And he walked it. I mean, he walked it. He didn't have any problem whatsoever beating everybody there. No. Well, I hit the driver very well on 18. I hit a I hit a drive past the bunkers. I hit an eight iron about what eight feet behind the hole, I guess. Plays with refreshing speed. This. Very important shot. And just look at the result. Only about six feet from the hole. I don't know of anything like it. I, I, I really don't. Torino can hardly believe it's true. The atmosphere, there's nothing like it. To walk up that fairway as a champion with your hat on and these people are up. It's like the old medieval days of the gladiator. The, the gladiator's going in. I've just defeated the guy. I've killed all the lions and everything, and I, I'm gonna go eat now. <laughs> and it's over, it's over, yeah. And it was over. Jacqueline sadly made bogey on 18 to fall into third place behind Jack Nicholas. Trevino didn't make his birdie, but his tap in to win his second Open Championship was followed by the trademark throw of the hat and a big hug with his caddy, Willie Aitchison. And he has this to win the Open. Six under, and Lee Trevino wins the 1972 Open by one stroke from Jack Nicklaus and 
Two strokes from Gary Jackson and three strokes from Doug Sanders. 84,000 people is unbelievable. And I think that you enjoyed the weather. I hope you enjoyed the championship. I'm very proud to be your Open champion once again. Trevino, playing in just his fourth Open championship, had achieved something remarkable. He had successfully defended his claret jug, joining legendary Open champions Bobby Locke and Peter Thompson, as well as an idol of his, Arnold Palmer, as the only men to do so post-war. Though still less than a decade into his life as a professional, and at the relatively young age of 33, Trevino's career at the Open had peaked. A man from humble beginnings, Lee Trevino had the ability and talent to compete and entertain in equal measure. When the history books are written, Supermex will go down as one of golf's favourite ever players, and perhaps as the man who changed the perception of what a golfer needed to be. While that character was built from cotton fields through the Marine Corps, one thing is for sure, that the Open will always hold a very special place in his heart.